And they heard the voice of Jehovah God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Jehovah God amongst the trees of the garden. And Jehovah God said unto the man, Where art thou? And the man said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And Jehovah God said unto the man, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commandest thee, thou shouldest not eat? Our reading tonight from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. And I would like to call your attention for the purpose of our study tonight to that question asked by God, Where art thou? One writer said, that it is the call of divine justice which cannot overlook sin. It is the call of divine sorrow which grieves over the sinner. It is the call of divine love which offers redemption from sin. When God asked this question of Adam and Eve, they were hiding in the garden. You see, here is Jehovah God reaching out to sinful man. Hastings observed that it is no doubt the question of a righteous judge from whose wrathful eye no leafy tree can shadow. It is at the same time the voice of the compassionate Father who himself goes forth to to search for the lost one who has strayed from him. And it is above all the voice of the compassionate Savior who has it already in his heart to guide the sinner through the darker depth of judgment to the glorious heights of an eternal salvation. I believe from what Griffith Thomas had to say and from what Hastings has observed that you get the idea that when we look at that one question, where art thou, we get, as it were, an insight into the mind of God. God will do anything that does not violate his very character to save a sinner. Tonight as we sit in this assembly before an almighty God who out of nothing made the heavens and the earth and we realize that we deal with sin and we fight sin and we have to battle with sin every day, we are so thankful that God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that if I will believe in him I should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16. I believe this question where art thou needs to be asked tonight. And I believe in the answers that we shall give every accountable being in this assembly tonight will be able, if he's honest, to see himself. I want to ask you tonight, forget about everybody around you. Forget about your family members. Forget about your neighbor. I want you to look at you. And I want you to look at you out of the mirror of the word of God because that's really what matters tonight. What am I willing to do with the word of God? What am I willing to do with what God has said to me? And if I leave this assembly not having made personal application in my life, then this study will have profited me nothing. Where art thou? When Jehovah God asks this question, some are going to answer, Lord, I'm in sin in the world. Because I am living 
in unrighteousness. Now, boys and girls, the un on the front of that word means not, not righteous. The root of the word righteous is the word right. Here's an individual that is not right. He is not right with God when he's living an unrighteous lifestyle. He is not right with his fellow man when he's living an unrighteous lifestyle. He is in reality not right with himself when he is living an unrighteous lifestyle. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul said, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. That, that sounds like reading the morning newspaper, doesn't it? nor revilers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Here are individuals that are unrighteous. And those things listed there are simply representative of everything of that class. Everything that would fall into that. You find individuals that are living in an unrighteous lifestyle. Tonight I'm looking only at me. I'm not looking at you I'm not thinking about others as I look at my life. And God asked me the question, where are you tonight? Is my answer, Lord, I'm in sin in the world because I'm living in unrighteousness. Some are in sin in the world because they are in rebellion against God. They are shaking their fist in the face of God and saying, I don't care what you say. I don't care what your word says. I don't care what you would have me to do. I'm going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to do what I want to do. And don't you send anybody to tell me any differently. In 1 Samuel 15, you remember Jehovah God sent Samuel to destroy the Amalekites. He gave him a very simple command, utterly destroy them. Everybody who can understand can understand that. Utterly devote them, utterly destroy them. They're devoted to me. You can't have them and you can't have anything that pertains to them. All of that has been devoted to me. You utterly destroy them. That command was plain. That command was clear. That command was understandable. And so they go, and then they come back, and Samuel comes, Saul goes out to meet him, and the first thing out of Saul's mouth is, I have done that which Jehovah commanded me to do. Now before you ever get to that statement, you find they brought back the very best, and they brought back the king. Saul says, I've done that which Jehovah God commanded me to do. Take that statement, compare it with the commands in verses 1 to 3, and ask the question, did Saul do what God told him to do? And you don't have to speculate on the answer when you get to chapter 2, verse 22. Samuel says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Saul said, we brought these back to sacrifice to Jehovah. You didn't have a right to bring them back. They weren't yours. They were Jehovah's. He had dedicated them to destruction. And then Saul said, well, it was the people. They wanted to do that. And Samuel said, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. That is, if you bring a sacrifice in disobedience to the will of God, God won't accept your sacrifice. Read Isaiah chapter 1. He makes that abundantly clear to national Israel. Behold, obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken, to listen, to pay attention, to obey, than the fat of rams. That's parallelism to say the very same thing in two different ways. And then he says this. For rebellion is as witchcraft. That's a capital offense under the law of Moses. Rebellion is as witchcraft, and if you mark in your Bible, rebellion and stubbornness, the American Standard Translation, is as idolatry and teraphim, the little household gods they use. Now you think about what he said, rebellion. 
Have you ever known anyone to say, I don't care what the Bible says? Or I know that's what the Bible says, but I feel right here in my heart. I know that's what the Bible says, but this is what I've made up my mind I want to do. Saul was told by Samuel, my dear friend, that is rebellion. When you can understand the will of God and you say, I'm going to do whatever I feel like I want to do. But not only did he say it was rebellion, did you look at the parallel word there? He said that stubbornness, folks. You ever known anyone, well, that you're looking at yourself? Have you ever hurt yourself because you were too stubborn to do right? You ever been there? I want to do this. I am going to do this. I've known individuals destroy their health because they were too stubborn to do right. They were too stubborn to discipline themselves and keep back from themselves substances that they knew they had been shown, they were told, would destroy their health. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm my own man. I'm going to live the way I want to live. I don't care what the Bible says about it. I don't care what the Bible principles are. I'm going to live the way I want to live. And Saul was told, dear friend, that is rebellion and that is stubbornness. And as far as God was concerned on the law of Moses, that was a capital offense. You could be put to death for witchcraft. That's serious business. When I stand tonight in the face of God and God asks me, James, where are you? And the only answer I can give is, Lord, I'm in sin in the world because I am in rebellion. Others are going to answer, Lord, I'm in sin in the world because I'm in disobedience to your will. In Colossians 3, verses 5 and 6, Paul said to the church at Colossae, put to death. Now, if you're reading from the King James, you have that word mortify, from which we get our word mortician. It means put to death. Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. He names five of them here. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he says this, For which things sake cometh the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. Now disobey is a jawbreaker word that just simply means don't obey. Do not obey. Will not obey. We sing, do we not? The, well, really, we sing the definition of the Greek word pistis that's translated faith. When we sing trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. It's a matter of trusting God and then doing what God said do. And tonight, if I'm sitting in this assembly claiming to trust God, but I'm not doing what God tells me to do, I am living in disobedience, and the wrath of God will come upon me on the day of judgment. And I'll live eternally in hell. Where am I? See, it really makes a difference where I am tonight. And when God asks me, where are you? Do I have to answer, Lord, I'm in sin in the world. Some are in sin in the world because they are just not ready. In Acts 24 and verse 25, you remember an occasion where Paul was preaching to a man named Felix and he reasoned of righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now that's a mouthful right there for any of us. Righteousness. There were some not righteous. Self-control. How many of us are out of control? We're not controlling ourselves. The judgment to come. How many of us really believe it's going to happen? And the text says Felix was terrified. You're reading from the King James, he trembled. 
That's the word that means cause the hair of your neck to stand up. You ever been that scared? Felix was terrified. I only think I've been that scared one time in my life. It's not a good feeling. Felix was terrified. And he said, go thy way. When I have a convenient season, I will call thee unto me. And then you keep reading and you'll learn he thought Paul's friends would bribe him to let Paul go. He's wanting money out of this. But notice what he said. I'm not ready. When I have a convenient season. Are you ready tonight to do what God tells you to do? Are you ready to do it right now? You see, the finest thing you could do in this assembly tonight, if you know what you ought to do to be a Christian, and you haven't been ready to do it, but you are ready right now, you ought to interrupt this sermon, and you ought to say, right now, I need to obey the gospel plan of salvation, and we'll stop right now and help you. That's how important it is. And yet a lot of people say, well, I'm not ready yet to obey the gospel. I still have some places I want to go, and I know I can't go those places and obey God. I still have some things I want to do, and I know I cannot do those things and be obedient to God. I still have some things I want to see, and I know I cannot see those things and be obedient to God. I'm just not ready. Now, sometimes we use a little different way of saying it. When I get all my ducks in a row. Well, you better kill the ducks because they'll never line up for you. And you'll die without your ducks lined up. Folks, if you could line your ducks up without God, you never would need to obey the gospel. You can't deal with the sin problem by yourself. Adam proved that, and mankind has been proving it ever since Adam. We don't have anything to offer to deal with the sin problem. And yet some say I just am in sin in the world because I'm just not ready to obey the gospel. I tell you, preacher, if I ever do anything, I'll obey the gospel, but I'm just not ready to do it. And some are going to answer, Lord, I'm in sin in the world because I'm almost persuaded. In Acts 26, 28, as Paul reasons with Agrippa, he says to him, now these things have not been done in a corner. And you claim to be an authority on Judaism. So I know that you are aware of all of these things and he recounts to him the account of his being converted and his obeying the gospel plan of salvation beginning on the Damascus road and ending in his saying, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. When Ananias said, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16, that's exactly, Paul says, what I did, and I did it right then. Now he says, Believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. And Agrippa said, the King James read, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The American Standard reading, with but little persuasion, thou wouldest fain make me a Christian. There wasn't any doubt in Agrippa's mind what Paul wanted him to be. And Paul's answer was, I would that whether with little or much, thou wert altogether the same as I am, except these handcuffs. Agrippa said, I know what you want me to be. I know what you're trying to do. And tonight if you're sitting in this assembly and you're wondering, is he preaching to me? The answer is yes. It won't do you any good if I don't preach to you. You've wasted your time and I'm wasting your time. Yes, I'm preaching to you. And if you're not a child of God tonight, because you are almost persuaded, I would say to you, I would with but little or much. You are all together the same as every Christian is. We want you to be a Christian. That's why we're having this gospel meeting. 
We don't want you to be lost. We don't want you to die in sin in the world and have to say, Lord, I'm in sin in the world because I was almost persuaded. You know the refrain of that song we sing, almost but lost. Saddest words. You stand in the place of a gospel preacher and there's a casket right there. And you can't say one word of comfort to that family. Because that family knows the person who lived in that body that's lying in that casket was lost in sin. You cannot say one word of comfort. You can try. When a child has to look into the face of the house in which his daddy lived and know my daddy died lost because he was in sin in the world. There's nothing you can say to comfort that boy, that girl. If I couldn't provide my children with anything else, if I can provide them with the knowledge when they look at the house in which I live, lying in a casket somewhere, they can stand there and know to the best of our knowledge and the best of my daddy's ability, he lived in obedience to God. Amen. I'd rather give them that than anything else. That's comfort. That's what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I wouldn't have you ignorant. And then when he finished that section... Comfort one another. And then that section goes through chapter 5, verse 11, and he ends that section. Comfort. Here's comfort. It's not in knowing when the Lord will return. It's knowing that he will and that I'm ready for him. And when he asked me, where are you? I don't have to answer, Lord, I'm in sin in the world. Where are you tonight? You're looking at you, remember? When God asks, where art thou? This question ought to bring every sinner from his hiding place. Not because I'm asking it, but because God is. And just like God knew where Adam was, God knows where you are tonight. You're not going to fool God. He knows where you are. He knows where I am. I may fool you, but I'm not going to fool God. Where are you? When God asks the question, where art thou? Some are going to answer, Lord, I'm in religious error. Now, Lord, I'm worshiping you, but your book tells me that my worship is empty. In Matthew 15, 89, of national Israel, using Isaiah as the backdrop, Jesus said, because you have elevated your tradition above the word of God and you are offering worship to God not based on his revelation but on your tradition, in vain do they worship me. And boys and girls, that word vain means empty. In emptiness do they worship. Teaching as their doctrine the commandments of men. When you ask them, where would you go to find what you're teaching? They will say, well, to this creed book or to this article of confession or to this writing of some human being. But where can I go in the word of God to find authority for what I do? It is not there. And if it is not there, when I do it, as far as God is concerned, it's empty. Do you know tonight what God heard if I'm not in fellowship with him when we lifted our voices to him in prayer and our minds to him in prayer as our brother led us, God heard silence. When we lifted our voices in song, if I'm out of fellowship with God tonight, God heard silence. As far as God is concerned, everything we've done in this assembly, if we're out of fellowship with God, is empty. No meaning in it. It's unacceptable unto him. 
and when I have to say, Lord, I am in religious error. Now, Lord, I'm religious. But what I'm doing has no Bible authority behind it. I'm saying to him, Lord, I'm going through some kind of religious motion, but as far as you're concerned, I might as well not be doing anything. It's empty. And some are offering vain worship because they have believed false teachers. In 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3, Peter changes words. Peter says in the past there were false prophets among the people. Then he changes words. He says, among you, there will be false teachers. See, the prophecy aspect is going to end with the completion of the New Testament. But the teaching aspect will continue. So there have been, during the age of the miraculous, and even during the time Peter was writing, false prophets. But there will be, once the miraculous ends, false teachers among you. And he said they're going to privily bring in destructive heresies. They're going to deny even the master that bought them. They're going to make merchandise out of you. And they're going to try to make money off of you. But the point Peter wants them to get is they are false teachers. Jesus said beware of false prophets. Matthew 7.15 who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. By their fruit you shall know them. And at the day, he says, they're going to say, did we not prophesy by thy name, by thy authority? Did we not cast out demons by thy name, by thy authority? Did we not by thy name do many powers, literally, many mighty works? I'm going to profess unto them, no. No, you didn't do it by my name. I was not in fellowship with you. I did not authorize what you did. Depart from me. I never knew you. You're workers of iniquity, but you were doing it in the name of religion. You were doing it in the name of teaching what's true. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are false teachers in our world today, and how do you know I'm not one of them? You see, your job is to check out what I'm saying to make sure that's what the Bible teaches. There's no place in any assembly for any accountable being to put his mind in neutral and just let somebody fill it full of whatever they want to fill it full with. My work in the assembly when I'm listening to someone is make sure that's what in context the book teaches. And if it is, it'll meet me in the day of judgment. And if it isn't, I don't need to pay any attention to it. Some are worshiping in vain because they have joined a church of man. And you remember in Matthew 15, 13, Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father planted not shall be rooted up, pulled up by the roots. Now, that just takes care of it, doesn't it? Are you in some church that owes its existence to some man? If you are, you can go high, no higher than that man for the authority of whatever you are. If you're wearing his name, you're wearing the name of a man. If you're doing something by what his book says, you're doing it by the authority of a man. And the psalmist would ask in Psalms 8 in reference to God, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? And if you read the Psalms carefully, the psalmist goes on to say, I know that without God I'm a worm. I'm dirt. And it goes no higher than that. And I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. I stand tonight on the shoulders of gospel giants. They blaze the trail upon which I walk. They fought the battles, the end result of which I enjoy. They saved some congregations to whom I'm allowed to teach the gospel. Nobody appreciates what our pioneers have done more than I. 
But I am not interested tonight in being a member of any kind of a restoration heritage church. I'm interested in being a member of the church I read about in my New Testament. I do not owe its existence to Alexander or Thomas Campbell, to Barton W. Stone, to Elias Smith, or to anybody else than Christ. Do I appreciate what they've done? Yes. Do I cite them as authoritative? No. God said it. That settles it. Psalms 119, verse 89. Where are you tonight? Well, Lord, I'm religious, but I'm in religious era. Some are going to answer, Lord, I am in religious error because I'm in a way that seems right. You remember what Solomon said about that? And ladies and gentlemen, Solomon tried it all. And some believe the book of Ecclesiastes is his confession in which he says, I tried it all and I proved it won't work. Don't you follow and make the same mistakes. Take my experience for it. And in Proverbs 14, 12, he said, there is a way that if you mark in your Bible, seemeth right. He didn't say it was the way that is right. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's serious business. If you've had some serious illness and the doctor said you were near death, that'll get your attention. You let a cardiologist look you in the eye and say one of your main arteries was 99% blocked and you'll open your ears. But when God says you are 100% lost, there are a lot of people who say, so what? No big deal. No big thing. Because what I'm doing seems so right. I want to ask you tonight, have you ever done anything that seemed right and later learned it was all wrong? Didn't it feel good while you were doing it? It tasted good? It smelled good? Everything about it was good? And then it turned out to be wrong. It seemed right. And that's not the word we use today, is it? Uh, what did Debbie Boone sing in her song? How can it be wrong when it feels so right? It just feels right. I want to ask you, have you ever felt right before you were right? And if you haven't, how do you know what right feels like? You see, there has to be an objective standard that goes higher than my feelings. If not, your feelings are as good as mine. Now, whose feelings are we going to use tonight? It seems right. Most of the time you hear people say, well, I like it. And the Lord is going to say, where are you? Lord, I'm in religious error. Now, when you think about Saul, do you think about a man in religious error or do you forget about that and just think about Paul? In Acts 26, 9 through 11 and verse 20, among other things, he said, I was not disobedient. I did exactly what God told me to do and you, you just read Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, and you watch him on that road when he meets the Lord. We'll have to get to heaven to know for sure, but it's my judgment that he changes meaning of the same word. He uses it in two different senses. When Jesus appears to him, you remember what he said? Who art thou, Lord? Now, that's the word kiri, and it could have been translated there, sir. And in my judgment, that's what he meant by it. It's a title of respect. Who are you, sir? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. What wilt thou have me to do, Curie? But there in my judgment he means master. He's changed his mind. He's come from a respectful address to a humble submission. What would you have me do, Master? 
You arise and go into the city, and there will be told thee what thou must do. And when Ananias said, the Lord has appeared to me, he sent me here, here's what he told you. Saul said, I did it right then, and in the very city to which I was journeying to put people in jail, I started preaching what I had persecuted. You think he'd made a change in his lifestyle? You think anybody doubted whether or not Paul made a change in his lifestyle? I was in religious error, but I became obedient. And when he wrote Romans 6, 16 and 17, he would say, as he could say of himself, I became obedient from the heart, that's up here, to that form of teaching whereunto I was delivered. And having been made free from sin, I became the bond slave of righteousness. And he said, that's what you Romans. Have done. Where are you tonight? So you're looking at you. When God asks, where art thou? Some are going to answer, Lord, I'm in unfaithfulness. Some members of the churches of Christ are going to answer, Lord, am I, I'm in unfaithfulness because I've neglected to do what I know I ought to be doing. Among other things, the Hebrew writer asked, how shall we escape if we neglect? Now he was talking to people who were denying what they had obeyed. And they were saying there's no longer salvation in Christianity. We don't believe that anymore. There's salvation in the law of Moses and we're leaving Christianity and going back to the law. And, and the Hebrews writer says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first was spoken by the Lord and now has been confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And he used the miraculous signs to confirm it. And in Mark 16, 17 to 20, you remember Mark said the Lord was working with them as they used those signs, confirming the word. So the Hebrews writer said we have a confirmed revelation and if we neglect that, there is nothing for us. How many of us have neglected the, the confirmed revelation? We aren't doing what we know God told us to do. Now, when you were rearing your children, did your children ever get to a point that they knew better than they were doing and you had to make an adjustment for their good? And how many times you tell your children, now you know better than that. You know better than the way you're living. You know the, better than the way you're acting. How many of us tonight as members of the church know better than we're doing? If you just get honest with yourself, are you doing it or not? You know what the Lord told you to do. Am I doing it? Sometimes we talk about Sins of omission, don't we? Now, in my opinion, that just makes it sound good, and there's nothing good to it. That just means I'm not doing what my Lord died to tell me to do. Oh, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. Now you're in rebellion, and you're in stubbornness. I'm just neglecting to do. Some are in unfaithfulness because they've just forsaken their duty. You remember the Hebrews writer in chapter 10 argues about the fact that here we are and there's a day coming, in my opinion, the destruction of Jerusalem that they had signs to see in Matthew 24 and we need to be exhorting and encouraging one another because this persecution can be tremendous and we need to be upbuilding one another in the assemblies of exhortation and some of our brethren have developed a custom of forsaking those assemblies wherein they'll get the encouragement they need to be able to endure the persecution and not fall away from the Lord. Do you know any folks that ought to be in assemblies because they need it and they have neglected those assemblies? Oh, you say, wait a minute, James, this Monday night in a gospel meeting, don't you understand that you have the very best people that could possibly be on the face of the earth has there ever been a time in the history of this congregation there were some very fine people who populated these pews on a Monday night in a gospel meeting, but they're nowhere to be seen now because they've neglected their duty. They've forsaken it. Demas forsook me, Paul said. That just doesn't sound good, does it? Having loved this present age, Demas has gone off. What have you done? I've forsaken 
my duty. Some are going to say, Lord, I'm in unfaithfulness because I have gone back to sinful pleasure. Now, Lord, I got out of it, but I have gone back. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Paul said, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are 15 the king in the American Standard, 16 the King James. Things similar to what we've already read in 1 Corinthians 6 and Colossians 3. And then he said at the end of that horrible listing of sins and such like. Now, what and such like means, I, I like to say, is these things and all their kinfolks, everything that's like them, everything of that class of things. And he's saying, I'm not trying to list everything. I'm not trying to list everything that a person might or might not do. I'm giving you an example of the class, the category in which those things will be found. And if you practice those things, you will not go to heaven. You are sowing to the flesh. You are carrying out the works of the flesh. And he says they are manifest. Fornication, idolatry, sorcery, envy, strife, jealousies, wrath, factions, divisions, heresies or parties, envies, drunkenness, revelings, such like. Anything that fits this category. Do you know folks tonight who left all that stuff? Sometimes we'll say, you know, they quit. But now they're right back in it. They're right back where they were. And Peter said the last end with them is going to end up being worse than the beginning. They were making a good beginning. They quit these things and now they're right back in it. And ladies and gentlemen, they don't know it, but as they live this way, they have removed themselves from the category of folks like Moses. In Hebrews 11, 24 to 26, Moses chose rather. Notice the word chose. To suffer ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And when he added it up, he was an accountant. When he added it up, he accounted the treasures of heaven, the treasures of the Christ, the treasures of God, greater treasure than what Stephen said in Acts 7, that he already had the words and the wisdom of the Egyptians, the treasures of Egypt. And he was willing to suffer, to live the way God wanted him to live, but he made a choice to I don't stay out of sin without making a choice to do it. You stay out of sin on purpose, just like you get into sin on purpose. Temptation may lead you into it, but you make the choice. Folks, you do tonight what you choose to do. And you may try to fool us and say, well, this one made me do it, or that made me do it, or peer pressure made me do it, or this thing made me... No, no, you chose to do it. Whatever you allowed to make, help you make that choice. I made that choice. And when I do that, I'm being robbed by the world. John said, don't love the world and don't love the things that make up the world, that are the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vainglory of life. All of these are of the world. The world vanisheth away and the lust thereof. But, look at my word there. He that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. He'll pitch his house and the floods that come against it won't shake it. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. He'll pitch that house and it'll stay. You see, you're being robbed by the world. You're being deceived and you're deceiving yourself. Paul said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And Hosea said, sometimes you reap more than you've sowed because he said they sowed the wind, but they reap the world. And some of us have lived long enough to either have experienced that or have seen it. You reap sometimes more than you sow. But you'll never reap out of the kind, Genesis 1, 
that you sowed. If you sow through the flesh, out of the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. If you sow through the Spirit, out of the Spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. Don't deceive yourself. Some members of the Church of Christ are going to say, Lord, I'm in unfaithfulness because I'm living an ungodly lifestyle. And Peter talked about that in 1 Peter 4 and verse 18. Here are folks that are ungodly. Now the un negates. And so here are people that are not godly in their lifestyle. And if you just let your Bible fall open, sometimes you can just pinpoint folks who are not godly. Individuals that are not living the way they ought to be living. They are un, they are not godly. And where shall, Peter says, the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, we know the answer to that. They're going to appear right where they are out of fellowship with God, and that's where they'll live in eternity. You see, like those that have been liberated by obedience to the gospel, now they've entangled themselves back in the world. And Peter says they're like a sow that you've washed that goes right back to the mud hole. If you've ever shown hogs in a show somewhere in a fair, and you get them washed, and you get them combed, and you get them shining, and if they can find a mud hole, that's where they're headed. And Peter says that's what the Christian has done that has been made pure, made white. Remember what Isaiah said? White as snow, whiter than snow. And you've gone back and soiled all of that by ungodly living. Tonight, as a member of the Church of Christ, when God asks, where art thou? Where are you? And then when God asks, where art thou? Some are going to answer, Lord, I'm in faithful service to you. Those are the folks I really like to talk about because they're the ones the world won't talk about. The world talks about the hypocrites. But here is what it's all about. I can tell you where they sit at Smyrna. I can tell you what they'll be about. I can tell you what they'll be doing. And I can tell you that there'll be a lot of things they'll be doing nobody will ever know about but them and God. But whatever they're doing, they're going to be in faithful, number one, and in service, number two, to God. What are they doing? Well, they are like Jesus in Luke 2 and 49. They are about their father's business. You remember what Jesus said? How is it that you sought me? It's an incredulous question, the way it's framed. How is it that you sought me? Knew you not that I must be about, the King James says, my father's business. Literally, did you not know I must be in the things of my father? You see, the faithful members of the church are about the Father's things. They left their things in the world. Galatians 2 and 20. They, they were crucified to the world. And now they live by the Christ living in them, by the faith of the Son of God, Paul said, Galatians 2 and 20, that lives in me. And they are about their Father's business. Can I say right now as I look at myself in the mirror of the word of God, Father, I'm in faithful service to you to the very best of my ability. I'm about doing your business. And Father, to the very best of my ability, I am giving you reasonable service. Service that is logical. Romans 12, 1 and 2, pertaining to the reason. I'm giving that which your word logically lays out for me to do as a child of God. I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice. I'm concerned with being holy. I'm concerned with being acceptable to you. I know that's my logical, my service pertaining to the reason. 
And I'm not about to allow this world anymore to pour me into its mold. Because I'm being transformed by the changing of my mind, the renewing of my mind. I don't think like I used to think. And therefore, I don't do what I used to do. I am now giving reasonable service. They're growing. Don't you love to see people grow? 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11, where does that start? We talk about, do we not, the Christian graces. Where would you start that list? Let me show you where Peter starts it. Giving all diligence. That's where Peter starts. A lot of people start with faith, don't they? But Peter starts with diligence. Now that means you do it and you act like you're doing it because you are doing it on purpose. And you're giving it everything you have. Giving all diligence in your faith supply virtue and your virtue knowledge, your knowledge self-control, your self-control patience. Your patience, godliness. Your godliness, brotherly kindness. Literally there, love of the brethren. Your brotherly kindness, agape, love. For if these things are in you in overflow, that's what that word abound means, super abound. They make you to be not bare and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, these things are in us and they are overflowing. That's the same idea, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, unmovable, always overflowing in the work of the Lord. And in 2 Peter 3, 18, I like the way Moffat translated that. He captured, as it were, the present tense of the verb there when he, when he translated it. Go on growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. First Sunday night of this month, a young man offered the invitation at Smyrna. Hadn't been a Christian too many years. One or two, I can't remember how long it's been since I baptized him. I was honored to perform the marriage ceremony for he and his wife. He offered the invitation. And I got choked up for joy. And I said to our brethren, isn't it great to see somebody grow? You see somebody as they mature, as they develop, as they put it together, as it comes together for them, and they are changing their lifestyle for the better on a daily basis, and they are helping others, and they're growing, and they're in faithful service to God. Now, it just doesn't get more encouraging than that. See, you can put names on this kind of thing. They're bearing fruit. And they are working and trusting. Ladies and gentlemen, bearing fruit means daily Christian living. That's what it is. Now, that means we're trying to help others obey the gospel plan of salvation, but it doesn't guarantee they will. So I'm not responsible for whether they do or not. I'm responsible for whether or not we give them the opportunity to do it. And all of us can do that. And in our work, we're trusting the Lord, like the Macedonians, who gave themselves to the Lord. Now, that solved everything else. What I'm asking my brethren to do is what God asked me to do and what God asked them to do. Give me you. And when I get you, I get your talents, I get your possessions, I get everything you're able to do in my behalf, in my kingdom. And you'll give me every ounce of ability you have and you'll be stretching and trying to get more. You won't ever be satisfied that you're there. You'll want more. You'll want to be better. One lady said, I don't come to the assembly to be told how great I am. I come to the assembly to be told how I can be better. I want to grow. I want to mature. Lord, I'm in faithful service to you. And I would ask you tonight, which answer is the answer you want to give on the day of judgment? And if you're an accountable being here tonight, where you are right now, if you die right now, is the answer you will give on the day of judgment. 
Where are you? You see, there's only one of these answers that will take you to heaven. In 2 Timothy 4 and 8, Paul said, This crown that's going to be given me by the Lord is for all them that have loved his appearing. And I love his appearing by preparing for his appearing by doing his will. But in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, the foolish virgins waited too late, didn't they? They had the same opportunity to be prepared as the wise, but they waited too late. And when they got back, the door was shut. You see, God will help you through his book. Tonight, if you'll come listening to his word, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins and being baptized so the blood of Jesus can wash your sins away, you can be raised to walk in newness of life. And if you'll walk faithfully to him until you die or to the point you will die for him. He'll say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Jehovah God said unto the man, where art thou? Jehovah God is asking you, where are you? And following up with this question, will you come to Jesus while we stand and encourage?